So, you know, there, there's sort of the predictions. Uh, hard to know really what the impact on mortality would, would, would be. The government, in fact, admitted that in their impact statement. They said, well, we're not very clear. We think they, they have the potential for impact on mortality, but they went ahead with this huge life-changing policy, not really knowing or, with, or not really, really stating that they thought there would be a very big effect. Today we have Professor David Payton. Uh, David Payton is Chair of the Industrial, of Industrial Economics at the Nottingham University Business School and co-editor of the International Journal of the Economics of Business. He has published widely in journals including, amongst others, Economic Journal, Economica and Journal of, Economic, of Health Economics. He has acted as an advisor to several government departments including HMM, HM Revenue and Customs, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, and the Department of Trade and Industry. David has been monitoring and analysing COVID-19 data and policy since the start of the pandemic, most notably through his Twitter ac account, at Cricket Wyvern. And today, David has come to talk to us on new evidence on the impact of the English care home vaccine mandate. Um, and this is brand new research and a paper that David is writing with a colleague, which examines the impact of the English care home vaccine mandate on vaccine uptake, care home staffing and COVID death. So thank you so much, David, and um, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Damini. So I'm just sharing the screen. Uh, has that come up for people? Yes, that's fair. So, super. So I should say, uh, for some reason, no government department has come to ask me for any advice on COVID policy. I'm not, I can't, uh, can't, can't not, not quite sure why. Um, but as uh, Damini said, this is, I'm going to talk about a new paper that's in the progress of being uh, written, so that we haven't, I haven't got a version of the full paper to share, but I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, later on, which I can have more detail on, on the stats for anyone who, who wants to delve into that and would really welcome comments before we send it out to, to a journal. Um, I, I, I thought but just before I do that, I would uh, just give a little bit of a background because I'm, I'm working on another project on uh, looking at the sort of ethics of lockdowns um, with John Keown from Georgetown University. And I think it's perhaps important because I'm an economist, so, you know, we, we, we don't Obviously, we don't have any ethics, so we don't we don't talk about uh, the rights and wrongs of things. Uh, of course, we have no morals at all. Um, but actually, although you know we're, evidence and data and numbers are, are really important, I think it's probably more important that we, we never lose track of what's really going on underneath, and that, that you know the data and uh, evidence should inform our sort of worldview of what we think should uh, should be going on. So I just thought I'd start with that on my sort of. Uh, ideas and I, and I, I quite like. I don't know if anyone saw, saw the article by Edward Hadass quite early in the uh, proceedings, where he talked about um, you know the impact of restrictions and mandates, and he talked in particular about respect for human dignity uh, more so than than human rights. And uh, you know he gave, he gave quite a nice typology of different things which are which were affected, really fundamental things of human behaviour, you know, like companionship, religious worship, right to education, providing for your family, you know, all these things. Which are really fundamental, um, and it's we, we need to remember that uh, you know when you have a lockdown or restrictions or mandates that these can affect these fundamental aspects. But that doesn't necessarily mean they shouldn't be done because, of course, pe you know, people say, "Well, okay, that's we don't want to do those things, but we're going to be saving lives, so surely that's worthwhile." And I, I think all, even people opposed to the restrictions don't always set out, you know, the, a framework for for understanding when that might be possible, because we do take decisions sometimes which restrict people's lives, you know, in, in wartime and so on, we might have curfews, we might have rationing, we might have all sorts of things. So in emergencies that happens. My, my sort of uh, feeling on this is that at a minimum, and it is a minimum, there are four things that need to be asked in the, in the sense of the COVID restrictions, mandates, lockdowns. And the first one is to remember that, you know, that the rationale for these unprecedented interventions was that otherwise health services would be overwhelmed and I think that you know, in a sense that's not a bad argument because if it's genuinely the case that the Ferguson models were right and you would end up with hospitals completely filled up not able to access anyone and you ended up with hundreds of thousands of deaths then you might have a case for doing something um, you know really drastic in an emergency. Of course we, we know that in practice that wasn't the case we now look back and we can see before every other all of the English lockdowns, um, infections were going down before uh, the, the lockdown was imposed. 
you know, there, there's very few cases where it looked like health services genu genuinely would be overwhelmed without intervening. But of course, even if it's the case that health services would be overwhelmed otherwise, we still need to know question two, will the restriction or the mandate you're going to impose be effective? Because it's all very well saying we've got a disaster coming up, but if the thing you're doing to intervene doesn't actually work or doesn't work very well, then there's still no point doing it. Again, we've got all sorts of evidence that su suggests now lockdowns and restrictions. We can't say they have no effect at all on infections or mortality, but uh, they may have no effect and they're certainly not very effective. Third question, even if they are very effective, we still need to think about the cost side of things. And we know the government really didn't do this, not just the economic cost, but the sort of uh, you know, social costs, psycholo psychological costs of the restrictions you're doing. And you need to be pretty sure if you're gonna, you know, we should have a high bar for those restrictions that they're, they're gonna meet that. But then lastly, whatever you're planning to do, is there a way of doing it without mandating things, without sacking people, without criminalizing people. So in other words, you know, is there a more proportionate way or whatever you're trying to do? Anyway, you know, for me, that's sort of, sort of a framework of questions, which I think is relevant in thinking about what circumstances might, and I think that for me, this is a minimum, you know, there may be some things we would never countenance doing, whatever the consequences, but are there some, you know, a framework for when we might consider quite, you know, extreme interventions? And um, before we get on to our research, a couple of points that occur to me in terms of the difference between restrictions and mandates. The intention and the, the stated uh, idea of lockdowns was that they were temporary emergency. You know, you know, we all know three weeks morphed into three months and in some places it looks like being more like three years. Um, but in, in principle, the argument for them was a, this temporary emergency measure, possibly with governments panicking or not, depending on, uh, you know, how much you want to believe about sort of coordination. I think vaccine mandates the way they were introduced are different for me because it seems to me at least they were more calculated you know it wasn't when we were in the middle of really extreme um, emergencies where we didn't have much data and evidence of course when they're introduced governments still like to give that impression they say we've got this big surge of cases it's all going to go belly up if we don't do something but you know really we were much further down the route of the pandemic we had much more data much more awareness of how things were working out and we could see you know, there's a much more planning for the mandate, certainly in England, you know, it was, the possibility was announced many, many months before it was implemented. And my impression, and people may have a different view, is actually the intention with the mandates was much more to be, not necessarily permanent, but uh, to, to put in a framework within which that sort of measure could be more permanent, if you like, um, whether, or, whether it relates to COVID man, uh, mandates. I think my, my impression is that the policymakers and many of the people pushing these things wanted to see this not as an emergency measure temporarily, as we had, as it happens with, in England, but we're seeing it as a long-term measure and perhaps a you know, radical change to how we saw um, vaccinations. They've also been really pervasive. So there's a lo lovely article you may have seen by Bardosh, uh, which I think has now been accepted for a, a journal. It was out as a, um, a, a paper. I've, I've, put, I've got a list of references at the end of the slides, by the way, if people want to check these out. And they, they gave a nice summary. This is from about... Uh, a year ago when I think or a little bit later when their paper came out looking at the effect of mandates and why they may be counterproductive and they went, went through the countries which were um, introducing one variation or another really quite quite a long list and things became much more um, pervasive even after this was published so it's really you know quite a big um, list of countries but interesting I think with mandates there was lots of discussion on the ethics even to, up to now there have been virtually no empirical evidence on the actual impact of these things. And of course, when they were introduced, you couldn't have much evidence because they hadn't been done. It was very speculative. But, but in writing the paper with Surafel, we've been going through the evidence uh, and you know, maybe things I've missed, but uh, I found a paper looking at a sort of case study on one nursing home um, in, the, in the States. There's a little case study on, on a single state on observational data. There's some um, conjectural uh, studies where they go and ask people, you know, what would you do if you had this, this mandate, that sort of evidence. But on, in terms of this is what has happened when a mandate was introduced, virtually nothing. And, and actually, I'm, I'm hoping that we, we don't get anything for the next few months so that our paper has a bit of, bit of currency. That's my, my other fear, that something just like ours gets published uh, next week and I mean, it's not so, not so relevant, but, uh, you know, that's uh, an academic uh, concern. So now we come on to what, what I'm doing with, with Surafel. And Surafel Gomez, he's a, an economist in 
uh, the School of Economics. I'm in the business school at Nottingham. I've worked with Surafil on quite a few projects. He's a really lovely guy. And by the way, I have no idea what his views are on lockdowns, on restrictions. Uh, he might be, you know, and vaccine mandates as it happened. We've actually never, never discussed them. My, my views are, you know, quite well known and no, no secret. I, I'm assuming he knows what my views are. Um, but, uh, you know, this, the paper is very much a sort of, this is what happens if, as opposed to is this right or is this wrong? I think you know, there's obviously policy impl implications, but it's not an analysis of the ethics and the rights and wrongs. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm guessing Surafel's views are, may, may not be way different to mine. Um, maybe he wouldn't have wanted to work on the project. I don't know, but they, they could be. So anyway, he's a, he's a very good statistician or econometrician. Uh, and a sort of, you know, the technical side of things um, is, is really da down to him. And we'd love, you know, if you've got questions on that or comments, especially when the full paper's available, we can feed them back to him. So as Domini said, this is a, you know, this is a world first, uh, uh, you know, nobody has seen these results before at all, to, uh, apart from me and, me and Surafel, uh, or I should say Surafel and me. Um, they are preliminary, analysis is still ongoing, so we're close to having a first draft finished, but I, I, I prefer if they, if they weren't cited yet. I know, you know, it's a few people publish working papers and so on, but, you know, we want to make sure it's in, at least in a reasonable state but, um, before we get to get to that stage. So, you know, if there's, so if there's, I'm happy to share these slides and the paper, but if you wanted to share them further, it'd be, it may be fine, but just to, to you know, check, check with me first so we can, I can let you know and there may be updates. Anyway, so, so the background, um, I don't know if, if we've got people from different countries, but uh, here in, in England, uh, back in June the 16th, the government announced the results of a consultation and they announced that they, well, actually the consultation, most of the respondents said they were against the idea of mandating vaccines in care homes. The government said, despite that, we, we want to go ahead and we're gonna introduce a law, which will mean that you've got a condition of employment for workers in elderly care homes in England to have received two doses of, of the vaccine. And um, there's three other key dates, which I think are relevant, because as soon as that was announced, things changed for care workers. You, know, you couldn't guarantee the law would get through, but the writing was, was seen to be on the wall when the government announced its intention. It was clear that you know, it was likely that something was gonna come in. That was confirmed on the 3rd of August when the mandate law was passed. And then they set out certain deadlines. One was the 16th of September, where workers had to have the first vaccination to be in time to get the second vaccination by the final deadline, by the 11th of November. So strictly speaking, nobody had to be sacked by the 16th of September. Um, you know, that it was only when the law came in on the 11th of November. Uh, but of course, you know, lots of care homes before then and by then were sort of making that a condition of employing new people and were making life uncomfortable for people if they didn't have the first vaccination by there. And I personal experience of this with a family member who was caught up in this process and September deadline was a you know, very key date for, um, for, for, for them. Uh, they, they ended up keeping their job, by the way, it's a long story. They weren't directly working in, in care homes, but they were, were affected. Um, so the, the English law is, is different to certain other areas. There are very limited medical exemptions. At the last minute, the government did make a, a, a slight relaxation when we got to November and originally it was gonna, exemptions had to go through, uh, you know, be signed up by a medic. They allowed people to self-certify um, and in fact they extended that to December so there was a bit more wriggle room if you had got through to November and you had a sympathetic um, boss that you could sort of self-certify uh, but in principle the uh, exemptions were very limited there was no exemption on conscience grounds if you were worried about the links between the vaccine and abortion for example um, you or some other religious objection uh, that wasn't the grounds for being exempted there was no immunity or testing alternatives so some mandates in other countries have had these alternatives uh, but also quite nice for for us as researchers the mandate didn't apply to Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland so that means that there's a nice sort of quasi experiment so you've got uh, you've got England where the mandate applied you've got these other nations where it, it didn't and that's sort of part of the basis of what we're uh, we're looking at in fact the data on Scotland and Northern Ireland is not so good we've got data on deaths but it's much better on Wales and we've got broadly equivalent data so so most of our study is looking at um, England and Wales and um, if we're thinking through what, what what we might expect to happen um, the sort of exercise you thought you think the government might have done and in some ways they they did but the, the principle of their argument was that um, it would increase vaccine uptake 
and you can see why if you're you know lots of people younger people may not have seen the job as the job has been very important um but they weren't so bothered whether they would have it or or, or not um but they were perhaps worried about losing their job and for those people who were sort of hadn't bothered to get round to it but were quite open to having it um you can expect they would increase uptake and they would have an incentive now to get vaccinated on the other hand some people we know didn't get vaccinated because they were opposed to it for whatever reason they were worried about side effects they were worried about conscientious objection or just um you know uncertainty about future potential future effects here it's, it's a little bit less clear what might happen with this group again you might have a fear of job loss and that might then say well yeah okay i don't really want it i'm worried about side effects but i'll get it anyway to keep my job on the other hand um Figueredo and uh, colleagues uh, did a lovely article looking at conjectured responses suggesting that mandates and passports lead to an increase in or a decrease sorry in trust so in fact if you were worried about you know conspiracies and what the vaccine's all about actually it could make some people less likely to be vaccinated you might sort of entrench your opinions okay I'm really not going to get vaccinated even if I have to lose my my, my job so, you know, I think broadly, it, it makes sense that you would think you would have, um, you know, some increase in uptake, but th this effect is not completely clear. But one of the things which I think is a, you know, a sensible prediction is we can expect the effect to be different in different areas. So if you think of an area where you've got a lot, lot of um, unemployment and it's perhaps quite hard, you know, you're a low skilled um, worker, perhaps in the, care, in the caring sector, maybe quite hard to find, a, to find another job. So in that case, well, you've got a bigger incentive to you know get vaccinated on the other hand if it's a very high employment area you know you can get other work elsewhere the effect may not be quite so big so that's a sort of testable prediction that we can look at um second thing thing people were worried well people care sector in crisis because of staffing and they're going to lose staff the government predicted that about seven percent of the workforce so around about 37 care home staff would need replacing and um, this was some, sometimes not presented in the right way, the government weren't predicting that we would see a reduction in staffing of 37,000 staff. That would they have sort of a, a low case, a middle case, and a higher case scenario. Because of course, the, the actual staffing uh, impact depends on two things, not just the number of staff who are prepared to lose their job, but also whether care homes can replace them. So even though the care home sector may be in crisis, you know, some of those staff who leave their jobs may still be replaced. So the overall impact on staffing is perhaps less hard to, to predict. And one of the things with our research, we can't observe staff leaving the sector. We can only observe the actual staffing levels at any one point. However, again, we would expect that if there is a net impact on staffing, and maybe there isn't if care homes can just replace staff who leave, that impact should be bigger in low unemployment areas because uh, there not only have staff got a, um, you know, more of an incentive or less of an incentive to get vaccinated because they know they can find a job elsewhere but also care homes should find it easier to replace people okay so again a, a sort of uh, empirical prediction and then mortality so this was the ultimate uh, aim of the, of the government to well to reduce outbreaks serious illness and ultimately death so, and their idea is if you have lower infections in care workers resident outbreaks would be re reduced and mortality would down would, would decrease but we all know some of the holes in this in this argument. We can't rule that out as a, as a mechanism entirely, but we now know, you know, with some certainty that the vaccination is not very effective against in fact infection transmission and in the long run, perhaps not effective at all. I don't know if you saw the latest ONS infection survey analysis, which they publish every other week. The last one came out last Wednesday. This is looking at uh, UK um, data on from their random sample of, of testing. And they look at the characteristics and one of the things they look at is vaccination status and this is a this is a sort of you know they've got all these different vaccination status not vaccinated is your reference and then they look at the likelihood of testing positive so the lower is this value the less the likelihood you are of testing positive relative to being vaccinated but key is a sort of p-value so if you've got a p-value that is um you know less than 0 0.05 then it's statistically significant or alternatively you could look, look at the confidence intervals so if you look at um you know let's say the first vaccine 15 to 19 days ago um the confidence interval come goes from 0.55 to 1.42 so basically you're saying there's no significant impact okay 
So when we look at the, um, the different vaccine status, virtually all now have no significant impact on infection. And this is from a random sample of people testing, so it's not due, due to different propensity to being tested. The only ones are if, you, if you've got a third vaccine between 15 days and 90 days ago, so up to three months, there's a bit of an effect. Um, the, fourth, the fourth vaccine, so the second booster, even now, the effect isn't very big, 0.76, so in other words, a reduction of infection of only about 24%, so not very much at all. Um, uh, and you, know, you, you would imagine that this will become insignificant, you know, probably fairly, fairly rapidly. So you can't say there's no short term reduction in infection, but there's very limited. It, it, it's hardly going to be a, a really big driver of, uh, of outbreaks. And um, there's other things, though. We know there may be population effects. So the unvaccinated may have higher numbers of people with previous immunity. There's not very good data on that, but the, the, you know, that, that's likely to be true. If you've already been infected, you're less likely to have the vaccine because you know it's less beneficial for you. So it actually may mean that the unvaccinated overall represent a lower risk, not just the same or, or you know, slightly higher risk. We don't know. There may be behavioural effects. So you, if, you're un, if you're vaccinated, you know, perhaps you change your behaviour, you take more risks. And this... Um, what in particular, you know, you, maybe you're less aware of your symptoms and perhaps you're less likely to test when you've got very low level symptoms. Well, of course, in care homes, they have a, quite a strict testing regime. Another, another reason why mortality effects may be quite limited. And then there's some evidence, there's a nice paper showing that outbreaks actually link to low staffing levels. If you have a real problem with staffing and you add to that with the, the mandate, you may possibly make infection outbreaks worse. Presumably that's because you've got, you know, it's harder sort of to make sure everything's being done properly and to um, prevent cross infections and so on. So, you know, there, there's sort of the predictions. Uh, hard to know really what the impact on mortality would, would, would be. The government, in fact, admitted that in their impact statement. They said, well, we're not very clear. We think they, they, there's a potential for impact on mortality, but they went ahead with this huge life-changing policy not really knowing or, with, or not really, really stating that they thought there would be a very big effect. Anyway, what do we do? What's our sort of methodology? Well, we, we have some, I think it's quite nice data. We have weekly data on vaccine take up and, they, and you can do this by the number, the percentage with one dose, the percentage with two doses. Actually, that's not quite right what I put that here. What we use as our key variable is, is a percentage of care home workers who were completely unvaccinated. And, it, and it's, it's slightly awkward because, of course, you know, early on, that was a big worry when it was announced in, in June. They had lots who were unvaccinated. Um, the actual mandate was about having two vaccinations. But the vast majority who got one ended up getting the second as well. And actually, it doesn't make much difference which one, you, which one we sort of focus on. But we also have weekly data on care home staffing. And we have weekly data on care home mortality. In other words, deaths linked to COVID from the ONS, so based on death certificate data, so where COVID was mentioned as a cause, not necessarily the underlying cause, but as a cause on the death certificate. The mortality data is pretty good in, the, in the, it's gone through the ONS quality standards. The vaccine take up and care home staffing data are reliant on submissions by care homes. So I think there is a question mark, uh, question mark there. And with the Welsh data that's equivalent, we have, that's not published. So we had to get that by freedom of information, but it does look to be very similar in terms of, it, as of, of its source to the English data. And then the idea is to look at, well, um, look at what happened in England local authorities relative to Welsh local authorities. So we've got lots in England, we've got about 100, we look at upper tier, about 140 uh, cases. So we're not looking at the country as a whole. Uh, and then the Welsh local authorities and say, well, can we track what was happening before the announcement? What happened at these different announcements when the law was passed, when you had this sort of first deadline and then the final deadline, where did we end up? But there's a problem with that. I think it's, you know, casually you can just compare England and Wales, but they're potentially very, very different. And, uh, you know, establishing a causal effect saying, well, you know, different between England and, and Wales makes you ask, well, OK, but what would have happened had England not imposed the mandate? How can we be sure what would have happened? And of course, we can't be completely sure. Um, but there has been a lot of work done in sort of social sciences. It's not an uncommon problem. You have a law that comes in in one area and not other areas, trying to sort of tease out a more of a causal effect. So I, I won't go into the, the, the technical detail, but 
our, our main approach, we look at a couple of approaches. Our main approach is to do what's called a generalized synthetic control method. And the idea with this is that you, you look at local authorities in the areas and you try to ensure, or at least you control, for areas that are statistically similar, looking at a range of variables. And really what you try to, to look at and see, well, when we make the comparison, making adjustments for these, uh, these variables, can we see similar trends and patterns before the intervention happened in the two areas? We know that, you know, for, for example, English local authorities on average, much higher numbers of um, black and ethnic minority uh, population. So it can be very, very different to, the, to those in Wales. But can we, you know, get a, a, broadly, a broadly comparable group? Then test for pre-event trends. So, you know, looking at trends in take up, for example, can, uh, can we get samples which are broadly similar? And then we look at what are called treatment effects. So average treatment effects on the treated for each week. And we can do this for each week from the vaccine announcement. But we, we do also look, put this in a regression framework as well, a sort of difference in difference thing. And the results are very similar. But I'm not going to go into the technicalities of those, but I, I, as I said, I'm happy to send the paper when we got it, got it as a draft and we'd love to get uh, comments on that if uh, anyone fancies going into it. Let, let's just look at the data, though, because first job is always to look at the descriptive data. So this is not trying to look at causality. And if you look at this, is the percentage of car, care home staff that are unvaccinated in England. That's that blue line. And that's the, uh, the red line. And these lines, the vertical lines here, are the week immediately before each of those four events. And you can see the starting point, they are very different. So England had lots more of these local authorities, which were um, had very high numbers of people who weren't vaccinated. Quite often in inner city London, in Hackney and parts of Birmingham, possibly linked to, you know, people have suggested it's partly linked to um, ethnicity and religion, that may be uh, an, an issue there. But, you know, whatever the reason, they are very different on average. So, you know, you had some areas with as much as 30% of care home workers were completely unvaccinated, whereas in Wales, the maximum, you know, was much, much lower. So this point about, you know, are we comparing like for like is important. You can see, you know, you can see that in the proportion in England was going down before the announcement. So this point about what would have happened had we not had the mandate um, come in, you know, the consultation being different would, you know, it, it's relevant. We would have still have expected numbers to be going down, but you can see when the announcement was going, the line suddenly becomes a bit steeper, whereas it doesn't really in Wales. There's not much of an effect there. Not so, but a little bit when the law was passed, again, it got steeper again, but when the September deadline came in, yep, there's a really big sort of drop, not, not much of a change in Wales. Uh, and then, you know, as we get got to the final deadline, um, yep, again, it really went down. And, and as soon as we got to the final deadline, another big drop. So, you know, the descriptive data is consistent with the mandate having an impact on take up, uh, not, not being the only thing driving it, but it does look quite different to Wales. Okay? What about uh, staffing levels? Well, Wales is staffing throughout the weekly staffing data, very, very constant. There was a slight reduction over, over time. Um, whereas in England, pretty, pretty clear what's going on. We've got, um, you know, slight reduction in the weekly data. We can go a little bit earlier, but there's, they don't have so much coverage of the, of the care homes. It's about 99% by this point here. As Soon as the announcement comes in, people leave. Can we be sure it's to the announcement? Well, it's, it, you know, fits in quite well. Doesn't really happen when the law is passed. So perhaps people had factored in that the law was going in. September deadline, yep, another big drop. Um, final deadline, yep, a really steep decrease in staffing. So this is a point where care homes, in theory, had to get rid of people. We have this, this is, is just a Christmas effect here. This is some sort of, you know, Christmas staffing effect. I think I would, I'm not too worried about that. But if you look from this point on, there was a gradual recovery, a little bit of a recovery over time, not that much, um, you know, suggesting that care homes were gradually replacing some of the people that left. Again, it does look like there was a staffing impact. Okay. You might argue, though, well, you know, care homes are in crisis. The crisis was worse in England. This was going to happen anyway. Well, possibly, but the timing looks quite uh, significant. What about deaths? This is deaths in England and Wales. I think this is harder to pick out from the descriptive data. We've got, we've got different scales for Wales and England, and these are just numbers. What we don't have is, is good data on the, the care home residents. Um, I thought we did at one point, but actually the data that came out of Wales 
it was clear they didn't really have a clue and they were adjusting it over, over time. So we have to work with the absolute numbers. Um, and that's quite, uh, you know, before the, the announcement, deaths were very, very low um, in both England and Wales. But if you look at the trends, it's not very easy to pick out anything very different. So we had the big surge, you know, after Christmas, early 2022. Did we have, you know, um, anything radically different in Wales relative to England? Doesn't really look like it. But again, we don't know the what if. So we can't rule out that there was a difference, that there was an impact on England when we get a true comparison group. OK, so this up to now, that's just the descriptive data. What's next? It's similar sort of pictures, but when, we, when we've done all that sort of pre-analysis, um, trying to come up with something that's comparable, so we can talk about it more in a causal sense. Uh, so these are our SCM, so our, our synthetic control method estimates of, of causal effects. So looking at take up. So this is a sort of idea. This is now saying, well, looking at the uh, English local authorities, what happened before this whole process started. So this is when the announcement happened, this dotted red line. And this is saying now not just what happened in England, but relative to Wales. So looking at the relative effect on English local authorities compared to Wales, making all those adjustments for um, to, to take account of the lack of similarity on population, on ethnicity, on unemployment levels in, uh, in Welsh and English local authorities. So we can see that they, they essentially they, they pass the test that once we do that, the pre-event trends are similar. So there's no effect before the event. As soon as the announcement happens, we see a big reduction in the number of people, in the effect of people who are unvaccinated, of workers who are unvaccinated. So in other words, what we're saying here is yet there was a very big effect on take up. And in fact, the, you know, the causal effect is sort of 60, 70%. So, you know, whereas in England before the, immediately before this point, we had maybe 17, uh, or so percent of care workers were completely unvaccinated, we can attribute to the mandate a big proportion of that drop, you know, that drop to about three, three or four percent. It does seem likely that a lot of that drop was due to the mandate, or at least, you know, as much as you believe our statistics and the, and the methodology. So a really big effect on take up. Okay. What about on staffing? Uh, again, yep, yeah, the effect does seem to be causal. So, uh, okay, we've got this weird dip around Christmas, which I think is an artifact of the data, but straight away, as soon as you get the intervention, you do get a causal, you know, big drop in causal effect. It's not so different, actually, we could have looked at the descriptive data and that story does seem to hold up. Uh, big drop as we get into the, the final deadline. Um, and again, we, we, you know, you look at the effects, it's around about three to 4%. So, you know, remember the government were predicting about 7% of people, of care home workers would, would end up losing their jobs, leaving the profession. From this, it looks like, uh, you know, roughly half of those were not replaced. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of the increase in uptake, yes, uptake, uh, the percentage unvaccinated went down. Part of that was due to there just being fewer workers. So if you think of a numerator, numerator and a denominator, you had fewer workers to, to count as being unvaccinated because some of them had, had, had left. That doesn't explain the whole effect. So clearly some workers did choose to get vaccinated as a result of the mandate. Um, so yeah, there was an increase in uptake, but there was, uh, at, it was at the expense of staffing. I won't show you the results, but actually the, when we look at, was this effect bigger in the, in the um, low unemployment areas, the effect on staffing? Yes, very, very clearly. So in those areas with, with low rates of unemployment, um, you saw a much, bigger impact on staffing and the other way around for uptake. So in the areas with um, you know, high unemployment where, uh, where it's easy to find, uh, not so easy to find another job, you get a much bigger causal effect on, on uptake. So that's at least consistent with that sort of you know, idea I was talking about before. Um, what about mortality? Because of course this is the key, you know, we, we, why would we be bothered about uptake? Well, we know the government is bothered about vaccination uptake, but that's not the driver for this policy. The idea is to, to um, you know, reduce mortality and serious illness in care homes. Well, this is the, uh, the, the, the causal effect on COVID deaths, again, looking in percentages. So now the treatment effect is much more, much harder to see. The gray line is a sort of uh, confidence intervals, really. So if we, if we can see this line zero, if the gray lines are above or below, 
then it's sort of looking like a significant effect. So here we've got a sort of positive effect, but it's not really anything. It's not statistically significant. It becomes a little bit significant here and much more so later on. But a couple of things to say on this. Generally speaking, the causal effect, the point estimate is positive. Not completely, there's a period where it's negative, but the positive means that if anything, um, we saw a relative increase in deaths in England that we might attribute to the vaccine mandate than a decrease. But probably overall, most of the time, we can't say it's statistically significant, but there are some weeks where it is, particularly later on where the effect was bigger. Now, I think we've got to be a you know, little bit careful mortality. We can be looking at small numbers, particularly before the event. We, we do sort of attack this in different ways. So we, we do have mortality data on Scotland and Northern Ireland. We add them into the mix. We get a very, the very same picture. We can't do as good a job for matching because we don't have all the data on ethnicity and so on that we use for matching. But, uh, you know, it's quite robust to that. You can frame deaths in another way. So another way would be to say, well, what's, what's a percentage of COVID deaths? of all deaths in care homes, you know, how relative to the deaths in care homes, because we don't have population data, which, you know, may mess things up a, a little bit, although we can control for different population sizes of local authorities, but there may be sort of weird things going on there. And I think when we, when we look at it the other way, uh, we, we get no reduction in mortality, but probably the line is a bit closer to zero and, and not significant. So I think with mortality, from all the ways we look at it, we can pretty safely say there's no observable impact on mortality. You know, if anything, with some specifications, it may be even worse than that. But, uh, you know, we'd be a little bit cautious on that result. So what are we saying? Yeah, you had a big impact on vaccine take up. Mandates work. Forcing people to take a vaccine means more people take a vaccine. I'm not sure we should be surprised at that. And uh, we probably people here have views on whether that is a positive outcome or not. But, you know, they, they work in that sense. But it's at the expense of a big, you know, reasonably big hit to care home staffing levels in a sector that was in crisis for staffing. So our overall, a three to four percent drop recovered a little bit in early 2022. But I think some of this was a very long term hit and worse in different areas. Um, so impact was take up was stronger in high unemployment areas, staffing levels stronger in low unemployment areas. And there are also we do look at some links on ethnicity, but I'm, won't go into that here just because of the, the time. Um, no evidence the mandate has caused any reduction in mortality. So uh, when you look at the policy implications, uh, for me at least, they're reasonably uh, clear. You know, you, whatever your view on the ethics, you might think, well, this sort of policy is completely unacceptable under any circumstance, coercing people into taking medical treatment. That's one view. Other people have taken the view when they discuss the ethics, well, you know, it's not something we want to do, but if you're going to save enough lives, it may be something we have to do and we think it's worthwhile. But I think I don't think anybody I would hope would, it, would disagree that you need a reasonably high bar for that second view. You know, you need to have some some solid evidence. So, you know, I, I think unless you really took the view that vaccine uptake was such an important of care home workers was such an important thing in itself. OK that based on the evidence we've got, and we can only look at mortality, we can't look at serious illness or hospitalizations, the data isn't there just from care homes, um, that there's no evidence, at least from the UK, uh, from the English care home mandate of any reduction in, in mortality. So I think, uh, you know, from a best case scenario that you think these things may be ethically acceptable, there's still very, very big questions about the, about the policy. So that, that's a sort of whistle top uh, overview of the uh, of, of, of the paper, um, I thought I'd leave you with one other uh, one other slide, which is one of my favourites. Nothing to do with the vaccine mandate, but but it, uh, living in Nottingham and being a, an academic, and it may be something we want to talk about in the discussion, the world of academia and how that's been. With uh, I'm sure David, as he's David Thunder's joined us, will have some uh, views on this. I can, I can imagine you know, what it's been like working in academia. But it's also in Nottingham. Nottingham always seemed to be the one that got in the news whenever something was going on. You had we, we were the first area where they decided to fine students ten thousand pounds for having a little bit of a party. Uh, in fact, I know one of my lecturer colleagues could see the party because they were sitting on it. They had a sort of rooftop terrace, and they were sitting on the rooftop terrace. And somebody, not him, it, somebody dobbed, dobbed them in, and it was a ten thousand pound fine in, in Nottingham. Um, uh, we, we were the areas when you know students were celebrating on Freedom Day, I think it was, you know, jumping about, hugging each other and what have you. Anyway, the, if, if ever there was a picture which summed up um, what we've gone through in the past couple of years, I think this was it. This was the one. 
Do you remember the uh, the 10 p.m. curfew that came in uh, for pubs back in September 2021? Well, uh, the, the following day, this was a picture that was blasted across the, the news. Crowds flooded the streets in Nottingham after the 10 p.m. curfew kicked in. And you may have seen similar pictures on the underground in London. And, you know, they, they, we had all these pictures of young people, you know, to crowded together on the tubes. And of course, they were, who was blamed? All these young people and all these people in London thronging onto the tubes and how irresponsible are all these people in Nottingham getting together? Uh, but was this not something that was completely predictable when the government decided to say that all restaurants and cafes had to shut at 10 p.m. without the slightest bit of empirical evidence to show that this will have a positive effect on infections? That the only argument they had for doing this, because I remember it clearly at the time, was that they're doing this in Belgium. That was what uh, they actually said, oh, it's, it's happening in Belgium, so we think it's going to be a good idea. It, for me, that sums up the, um, how can we describe it? Well, it, utter insanity of some of the things we've endured over the, over the past couple of years. But anyway, that, that's nothing to do with the care home vaccine mandate, but uh, I, I just like the photo. So anyway, I hope you found that uh, of some interest, and I'd love to know views, questions, and, and I'm you know, quite happy for the discussion if Domini is to go into anything we like, academia, evidence for lockdowns, or um, you know, our, our paper, of course, as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. This is a, a very interesting paper. And um, I, my question is really uh, goes beyond the remit of the paper. So but I'll, I'll, it's more of a philosophical question, really. Um, I'll just preface it by saying, as, as you probably can guess, my general take on this is that we need robust protections for our liberties that are not subject to utilitarian uh, calculations or second guessing. Um, and I think there's a reason for that. I think bureaucrats um, and civil servants, when you have the ability to, uh, to calculate utility, to make utilitarian calculations, they will they will tend to use that ability to authorize uh, interventions. That that's kind of a that's a hypothesis anyway. But but generally, I think that um, this there's a reason why we have these robust protections and why we have the concept of human and civil rights. Um, and and so just that's the first comment. And the second thing is, um, I'm not an absolutist about that because I can imagine Armageddon-like scenarios in which even human rights, or what we consider human rights, like informed consent, uh, the right to uh, free movement might be restricted. You said yourself about wartime curfews, for example. So it's not that I'm an absolutist about these rights, but there is one thing that I really do worry about a lot, and that is the idea that we can speculate about future outcomes and based on those speculations that are actually informed by very incomplete data, that we can then say, well, it's possible or likely that the vaccines will have a significant effect on mortality. Therefore, uh, if we could just rev up the vaccinations, we can reduce mortality, right? In the face of all of these unknown variables, for example, we didn't even know um, about these vaccines. We didn't really have good long-term data on their impact when they came out um, because the, the original trials were actually short-term trials. So we didn't know whether they'd be robust, uh, you know, whether immunity would be robust and enduring, um, for example. Um, so I, I, I wonder, um, uh, I wonder what is the weight we should place upon speculative projections that are very difficult to either prove or disprove. Um, because it seems that during the whole pandemic, these kinds of measures, including the vaccine mandates and the lockdowns, have been justified based on speculative projections. Um, and when I say speculative, I just mean very questionable, based on questionable or incomplete data, uh, with, whose probability is not very high. Um, so what's your thinking about that issue of the use of projections to justify uh, harsh interventions? Uh, thanks, David. It, it is tricky, isn't it? Because I think if you're in this sort of Armageddon uh, situation, uh, 
and you've got, uh, you know, you're, you're wanting to do something, you may, you may have to be in a position where you'll think you, you don't have the data on what the impact of this thing will be. So, you know, I don't know, you've got a blackout curtains, we don't know if that will stop, uh, you know, houses being bombed in the Second World War. But uh, you do have a duty, I think, to have a quite a high bar for and, and you know, rigorous look at the evidence. And, and so it's not just speculation. But actually, the government impact statement on uh, when, they, when you look at the announcement after the consultation was, was fairly cautious on mortality. They, they weren't really saying this. Well, we don't really know how we can model these things. But I think there you really are um, absolutely right. You know, when you've got you have to have a high bar for these things if you believe they should be done. Uh, acceptable at all you may not have solid empirical evidence for them but you need to have a very good rationale for why you think they'll be and you're thinking through the costs as well and I think time and time again that wasn't really that wasn't really done and when it didn't take long to think through the likely impacts on mortality when you look forward about the testing regime very early on you know it was clear that um, it's not just the Omicron stage but from the UK HSA data that vaccines were much less effective at preventing infections than we, you know, that, that people might at first have, have hoped, which straight away should have raised a question. The idea that there could be behavioural effects that we weren't sure about, that you, know, you could have, you know, counterintuitive impact should have been factored in. Um, and I think with this particular intervention, you know, you, it was a case for not doing it at all because of the ethics, but actually it was done very, very badly and no willingness to re-examine the case at all. It was, we have taken this decision for whatever reason and we will make our speculation fit the fit the evidence. I, I think there's a you, your initial point about uh, you know we've got to base this on the ethics and human rights. Uh, I do agree, and, and I think it's a question of how you know research like we're doing might fit into that. In a sense, you might argue that we're we're sort of playing the game by looking at this sort of utilitarian approach as to what will happen if, um, and saying, well, oh, look, these weren't very effective. Perhaps that sort of plays the game of saying, ah, oh, but had, if they had been effective, it would have been okay to do. And somebody else, you know, what social sciences is like, somebody else looks at another set of data and comes up with a different conclusion, or oh, then it's sort of justified. So there is that sort of danger. I think as an empirical economist, uh, I can't afford to play those games. I wouldn't have a job if I, uh, if I never did any empirical work looking at the what, what's in, in it. And I think it is going to happen. You know, people are going to analyse the data. So I, I think, you know, it's better to, and I think, I think we're doing a thorough job given the limitations of the data, what we're doing, and, I, and I'm quite ha happy we, we do that. And then you know, as long as we're clear about the difference between the, you know, what, the ethics and the policy, and, and we're just saying this is the, what actually happened from the policy, then uh, yeah, I, I, I think that, that comes in with the sort of transparency, truth, data, uh, probably is going to be uh, the, for, the, for the benefit of things overall. Sorry, just one quick point on that. Like, I think probably uh, it's also true that we'd have to distinguish different types of interventions because um, proportionality considerations might come into bear, for example, in uh, with respect to some kinds of restrictions, um, like say closing schools during a pandemic. Uh, maybe, maybe in a pandemic that is really very contagious in the schools, then there's like a case for closing schools where the virus actually is being transmitted by children at least for a short period. I'm not sure there might be a case for that. But to me, that's in a very different category to taking away someone's informed consent to medication. To me, that's like a much graver violation of a right than closing a school for, say, a few weeks or for one, even for one month. Um, anyway, it's just a, just a thought that there might be different standards applied according to the gravity of the rights violation. Thanks, David. Um... Another David, David Bell. We're all, we're all David's here. Yeah, I know. There's three of you today. Yeah, there's, a, there's a good doctor who's fought too many Davids. Um, <laughs> it's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? There's way too many. Um, so, yeah, yeah, thanks, David. That was interesting and, you know, all predictable, unfortunately and sadly. But um, I'm just wondering, because you said this is you still, this is the first draft, et cetera. Um, how you, what do you think is the best way to get this sort of information out? Because I suspect that most journals, most top journals would just not print it um, unless you write, uh, conclude from it that vaccines are safe and effective. Um, and um, it's really difficult to get this in most of the media, et cetera. So, but, you know, people need to understand this 
if because the bandwagon is rolling on and they want to, you know, this will happen again. Um, so I'm just wondering now how you think this is best, the best way to get this out so that people stop ignoring sort of these obvious things. Thanks, David. So what we want, we're planning to send it to a peer review journal. Uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic than you about um, the journals. There's a big range out there in, in, in the economics field. I think people are a little bit more yes. open to yes. this sort yes. of yes. thing. And um, yeah, you know, we, you know, frankly, we've got to be careful not going outside our uh, area of ex expertise. And I don't, don't mind doing that. You know, you can draw your own conclusions if you like in terms of the, the, the policy. So, um, you know, there, there, are, there are some economics journals that are, that are published or are publishing some, you know, reasonably critical stuff on this area and there's one or two quite good ones uh, I mean I, I think you, you do need to be in a peer-reviewed journal really to, to, to give this cre credibility I think and once it's there and I think there's a second then you know if we're successful in that and unfortunately as explaining at the start before lots of people here it's a very long process and um, you know in, in a sense we want to get it in a good journal and you know there's a good chance it will get rejected from a good journal and in a sense if it doesn't get rejected you've probably not sent it to a good enough journal um, but then if, if, if the editor's potentially interested and it goes to review, you know, that takes several months. So, so it may be a long process. Um, but I think you really, we really do need to get it there. Once it, or if and when it's in a peer review journal, then the, the sort of PR or um, you know, public engagement, if you like, that is a different matter. And, uh, you know, there are outlets which are interested in th this sort of thing. You know, the obvious place for academics is a conversation. I don't know if people see... Uh, articles in there that's where you people academics often produce a sort of more public friendly version of their research they've had a very pro covid restriction approach most of their covid articles so i suspect they might might not be interested in this sort of thing but there are places where you know you know op -eds like someone like the telegraph or the spectator where you might get something which is you know you can get you can get a broad broader audience but i think once it's in in a peer-reviewed journal um if, if it's in a decent journal it, no, it does get taken seriously and it can be cited and people can you know can, can work on it so um, I'm, I, th I think it may take time but I'm a bit, perhaps a bit more optimistic than you about how you know we can get the message out. Yeah, it, 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 I mean it worries me that the time it takes in these you know laws will be put in place and rules will be put in place. That yeah I'm, I mean and, and, and I mean two minds you know the other options for us to put it out as a working paper so yeah. not peer reviewed. Um, sometimes some economics journals are a bit funny about that. You know, if it's been published, they they sort of say, "Oh, it's already been it's already been published yeah. and, and yeah. talked about." And yeah. uh, and and also, you know, I'm not quite so comfortable if it's not being peer reviewed because I think a topic like this would get lots of attention, at least in their sort of COVID policy critical community. Uh, and I'm you know I'm slightly uncomfortable when it's not been through the peer review process and things yeah. you know sometimes do do change. But of course. That does have the advantage at least it's out there and it's something people can refer to and i don't know if it's worth actually doing that so it's on the record but not making a big fuss about it but at least it's there for those in, you know want to cite it i, I don't know I, you know or perhaps perhaps even giving a draft confidentially to politicians and whatever to, yeah that's not a bad idea who actually. Are, you know sensitive to this area so they have something to work with yeah. Yeah. thanks and um, piers uh, thanks. That was very interesting talking. It's always good to see the data. I think, you know, in, in a way, some of the conclusions are as, as to be predicted or as, as expected. I was thinking in terms of, you know, the realities, and you made this point at the beginning that about the indication regarding mandates was it seemed to be a permanent thing that was being pushed for. And of course, that's not the focus of your research, but that's your instinct that they were trying to turn us into a permanent state of affairs and so on. And of course, that points to kind of the political context in which is, this is all occurring. And I think, you no, know, maybe so picking up on, on some points that have already been made, this idea of how one as a researcher thinks through how his or her research might get used in a context which is highly political, how much you can think through and guard against that. Because I'm kind of sort of looking at it from the point of view of you know, the government position or the, the pro-mandate position. Um, you, you might think that your conclusions seem to sort of pretty much rule out this as making any sense, but I can see the kind of uh, 
political response to this is that, well, it in improves uptake, which is a good thing. Um, it has a negative impact on staffing levels, but that's just a temporary thing because once you've cleaned those people out of the system, it won't continue to be the case. You'll have people in the system who are happy to take the vaccination. And then they can probably sort of argue one way or another about impact and mortality that maybe that won't be the case further down the line. It's better that people um, have the injection and so on. So, you know, it, it's... I, I wonder how much you can try and work to, to, to guard you, your conclusions from that kind of politicization and instrumentalization. Because um, that's the reality, I think, with COVID-19, is, is that clearly there is a bigger political drivers going on surrounding this. So everything that one tries to do, even when you're trying to be absolutely rigorous and, uh, and objective and so on, you've got to think about how your research is going to end up getting used in that broader political context. And I wonder sort of if you thought about how you could, how you can try and guard against that as this research comes out and as it sort of inevitably gets spun and so on. Yeah, good, good question. I, mean, I think COVID policy is a great example of, you know, they never let the crisis go to waste, do they? You know, a crisis is always turned and, and become something uh, they, they can use. I remember when the vaccines were first announced, my me immediate thought you know, this back in October 2020 was okay this is going to be used to extend lockdowns and of course you know it, it, it was um so yeah it's, it's tricky and, and I can I think you're possibly right you know that the was finding on uptake will get spun in that way oh look these these really work to increase uptake um I don't, I don't really know how we guard against that I mean I think one you know these things are all a lot of it's perception isn't it you know so we've got a bit of data on ethnicity in different areas and there are some ethnic differences and that might be one way to sort of focus look at well you know they, they seem to be targeted and, and hit people from certain ethnic groups more than, or areas with high levels of certain ethnic groups more than others and you know that's a sensitive area for for policy makers as well so there may be a way of sort of um, framing that so that it's, it's a bit harder for them to uh, get over uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have an answer to that. Just while I'm on that, there's a question in the um, chat about, about Wales, you know, why was uptake so different in Wales? Uh, the, one of the answers was, well, you know, was that due to the sort of culture of fear in Wales? It may be, I think it, it's probably that, not, not quite that, I think, you know, there was genuinely more vaccine hesitancy in some of these big inner city areas in England, like, you know, like Hackney, other parts of London, Birmingham, um, particularly areas where you've got high numbers of uh, high Muslim population, um, you know, Clark, income probably has something to do with it. I think there's some evidence that vaccine hesitancy is, is higher in sort of poorer areas, and they are just they genuinely are very different to, to Wales. Now that you know that the, the government can say, well, you know, this was why we had to do the policy in England, and they didn't have to in Wales because we have these areas of very low vaccine uptake amongst um, you know, care workers. So the policy was potentially sort of, was an endogenous cho choice. And, and there may be some truth in that, you know, in Wales, they didn't feel the, the pressure to, um, to do that. But I, I think there were genuine differences in, in the two countries. But uh, anyway, Piers, I think you're, it's a very good question. I know that I don't know, maybe somebody else got an answer of how, how well, best to spin it. I, well, um, I wouldn't like to put it in terms of the best way of spinning it, but um, I, one thought which did come to mind was, was that the evidence you've got that the, so for example, the mandate uptake, so the uptake of the injection increased in areas with high unemployment, yeah. So that uh, an interesting thing to draw out of that is emphasis or that you know, supports the coercive nature of this that this policy is working in particular on people who are in a context in which it's going to be particularly persuasive. And that context is, is one of, of essentially you know, deprivation or lower socioeconomic background. So, it, you know, I think that, that, you know, talking about that does help to draw out the coercive nature, the fundamentally coercive nature of the, man, of the mandates. Um, and it's worth talking about because that then ties into the ethics and so on. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and David Thunders made the point about the, you know, clearly the real, real interest in this is a mortality effect, you know, certainly in England, they haven't talked about mandating it across the general population and care workers are a small part of that population. So the real driver was mortality. I think that, that's clearly the case, but I think Piers' point was, it doesn't matter what the reality is, it's how it's likely to be spun politically. And that there, there is a genuine danger there. Um, David, I just wonder, extrapolating forward, do you think that mandates may become, come back in at a 
a later date? Do you think they might enact well, it? it? It's interesting, isn't it? Because we've got this long tradition in England of not having compulsory vaccination, even for professions. And there's a lot of talk about um, the uh, hepatitis vaccination requirement for care workers, which of course isn't a legal requirement, but is a sometimes a condition of employment, although they do have, a, I think, a, a you know, evidence of immunity exemption. But actually, as a good, I think, you know, looking back, perhaps that's something that people should have opposed a bit more strongly at the, at the time. But, you know, is that a good thing to have? And is that really, really justified? I think in the, my perception in, in the UK, there's been a reasonably good job done to demonstrate the opposition to that type of approach. And in a, in a sense, they possibly overreached their hand because I, my, you're guessing here, but my, my guess is that the COVID vaccination was meant to sort of change the landscape. So it would become more acceptable to have, for example, compulsory childhood vaccinations before children can go to school. And that's been, I think Jeremy Hunt's talked about that in the past, hasn't he? Um, and maybe Matt Hancock as well. So, you know, I'm sure that's on the agenda. I, I wonder if this has not necessarily done that, ag done that agenda much good, mm. partly because uh, the evidence is so clear now, I think, that uh, it, the COVID vaccine is so poor at reducing infections, at stopping infections. It, you know, and people have different views on how, how good it is at reducing deaths and serious illness, but you can at least make a, you know, a, a case for that. I think for reducing infections, at least in any long-term sense, it's much harder to do. So it, it starts to make, you know, as more and more of that data comes out, it starts to make these attempts to um, impose vaccination more and more absurd. It doesn't mean that, poly, you know, there's sort of hysteresis. It's much, politicians, much harder for them to admit they were wrong and to go back on things. So I think it'll be a hangover for a while. Mm. But actually, once they go, I think in England now, we've got that much harder to bring it back in. So there, there's a, you know, there, there's a job to be done, isn't there, in terms of public opinion and making sure the evidence is used in the right way and not um, and not captured for a, a, and spun in a, in a way to, to you know, help their agenda if you, if you mm. like to think like that but I, you know, I wonder if there's been a bit of overreach and actually what they might have hoped to use COVID as a sort of battering ram to get a broader agenda on um, mm. you know compulsory vaccines uh, may, may actually have the opposite effect. Just wonder if, if mandates may morph into something else I don't know if you saw that article it came out two days ago from the Oxford University Centre for Business Taxation talking about taxing the unvaccinated. Yeah, and I, I saw that and I, I, I did a sort of Twitter thread on it. I mean, can you can you think of anything more tone deaf and utterly <laughs> ridiculous? You know, it's, it's an argument you can you can make an economic argument for an externality or what they call an internality. You know, you protect people from themselves. That's not unreasonable to make that argument. Mm. But you don't make that argument for COVID vaccines when it's so obvious they don't have that externality effect. They don't stop you, apart from maybe a very short term period, transmitting to to others. So it just makes them look completely. Daft. It doesn't stand up to the slightest scrutiny, but I'm sure there lots of so, Well, their final line was in the end, we believe there is a serious case for yeah, con considering yeah. taxes based on vaccination status. It's like current, they call it risky behaviour if you're, you're not vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder if they, I mean, they seem to not want to drop it. It seems like they still want no, to. I know. I know. I mean, how, you know, how, I don't know how those academics involved can look, look in the mirror with a, with a straight face. Are they, are they simply unaware of the evidence on back? I think perhaps people are. Perhaps people, you know, don't, don't look at the. In, in England, the, the that ONS data saying there is no statistical difference in uh, in infection rates. Mm. How, how can they how can they be so unaware? They're obviously not unintelligent people, but you can't hide that that data for forever. So I, I've got a question for David, if I may. I'm, I'm sorry, I, my technology isn't sufficient. <laughs> yellow, a yellow no, hand. Gary, go ahead. You can see your hand, Gary. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation, David. Really, really interesting. Just, just back to the actual trial that you did, um, I was just wondering whether there was any measurable difference in some other variables between Welsh care homes and English ones, particularly around their propensity to lock down and stop all visitors. And I just wonder whether there was any, whether you actually measured that and whether there's any difference in the propensity to do that, not least because there is a little bit of empirical evidence that things like loneliness, uh, particularly in the elderly, can contribute towards premature death. So I just wanted potential confounding variable, possibly. Yeah, you're right. And, and the answer is no, we, we, we can't do that. Because because we're looking at local authority data, we'd need something on diff, you know, the different policies in local authorities across the way. I mean, my, my, just anecdotally, 
Uh, I know Wales was probably stricter than England in all sorts of areas, but the care homes have been pretty brutal in England. So I'm not sure there's been a systematic difference in care homes in England and Wales. There may well be individual, well, there are individual care home differences, and it would be lovely to be able to track that yeah. and then aggregate it up to local authorities. But I, I, I'm not aware of anything that would you know, enable us to, to do that at all. Um, I suspect there's no, that hasn't been collected. You know, they, they've been collecting, all care homes had to put their submission each week on vaccination data and staffing data in Wales and England. I, I suspect they haven't given more general policy information. It may be Care Quality Commission would have that sort of data perhaps you certainly get it from inspection reports I, I guess but quite hard I think you could you know I think that would be really good to do and I think you know our sort of broad brush empirical study looking at is, is, is valuable but you need to complement it with a sort of more qualitative in depth going into looking at case studies and so on and I, I think that that's where you might get some of that work okay. being done. Um, thank you thanks Gary um David Thunder um, thanks. I, I was just thinking that um, behind all of this, it just strikes me that uh, the issue of risk and tolerance towards risk seems to be a huge issue here. I mean, basically, I can't imagine living in a free society in which the tolerance of risk was extremely low, because um, if that was the case, uh, you would have to, I mean, you'd have to take countermeasures against all sorts of um, risks that we can think of, uh, including the flu, um, which kills quite a few people every year. Um, I mean, and we'd probably produce perverse effects in health by doing that because people would be less exposed to viruses, their immune systems would probably suffer, which is the irony of all of this is that the more we try to control things, very often the, the worse things go. Um, but, but it does seem to me, um, that, that there's there's a big issue here to do with uh, the management and toler the tolerance of risk and that and that really um, I mean I thought about this also because my wife is currently expecting so uh, so like I read that pregnant women have a much have a significantly higher vulnerability to the flu than um, than other members of the population um, and it kind of made me think and then I thought but pregnant women, go about their lives pretty much as normal in the first, they don't seclude themselves completely from society. There are so many things we do in which we go about our lives, even though there are real risks involved, uh, leisure, sports, socializing, uh, you know, if you're fragile, if you're elderly, you expose yourself to the potential of a flu that could kill you and on and on and on. And, um, and, 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 and so one thing is for a person to be nervous about risk and then to try to manage their own risks. Another thing is then to authorize a big brother or a state or a government to manage the risks for me and to really minimize all of my risks. But I feel that we're heading in a direction of a society in which we want government to anticipate and sort of step in to stop possible bad things from happening to us. And that the cost of that in the long term would be the surrender of, would be severe cur curtailment of our liberties. Sorry for that, that's not exactly on topic, but it seems that it's in the background of some of the issues you, you, you touch on in your paper. Yeah, yeah, and I, I completely agree. You know, they threw the rule book out of the window, didn't they? From, from this sort of idea of you're in, approaching Armageddon so, we've got, so we can justify intervention, it very rapidly became this single focus on reducing COVID deaths, not just mortality, just co that focus on that one thing. And, the, and you got this idea of if it just saves one life, and of course, it, it makes no logical sense you translate that to any other environment where we look at both costs and benefits, and we accept some level of risk. And, and what, you know, it, it's not directly what we're looking at, but where better than in care homes, where, you know, they've had the most brutal regime you can imagine. Uh, and Gary was talking about, you know, the visiting rules, and yet very little thought about, well, what risk do the care home residents actually want to or are willing to take on and what is right and what agency do we want to give them in terms of deciding you know these because we maybe finally you're talking a week but we've been talking two over two years now and what's the average time somebody spends in a care home well in a nursing home probably less than two years but for very elderly people in a care home maybe a little bit more 
we're talking a huge chunk of their lives. So what attitude would they want to take to, to risk in terms of the trade off of seeing their grandchildren or their children or whatever it might be, understand that you know, there may be a higher risk of and, uh, you know, how that will work out and even allowing, you know, making the case, well, we're worried about the risk from other to other people, but actually, you know, are, are, you, are we willing to take to accept that sort of risk as well? Traditionally, we are, you know, your next door neighbor's got their grandchildren coming in. OK, there may be some slight cross infection risk going on there. And traditionally, you know, with the flu, we've uh, we've accepted it. And that seems to have completely gone out of the window. So it's, it's you know, odd how things are very quickly morphed. And I think you're absolutely right to talk about the dangers of how we look at public policy and um, in institutional policy. Uh, in a very different way post COVID, and, and it's really important that we, you know, go back to some some sense of how we've traditionally looked at risk.